Welcome to the third webinar of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Extension's 2022 Small Ruminant Webinar Series. Tonight, we will hear from Jean Schrieper, an extension, a former extension educator and Iowa County sheep producer. I am Carolyn Eady, the Ag Educator for Crawford and Richland Counties. Lisa Seafeld, the Ag Educator in Eau Claire County. Ashley Olson, the Ag Educator in Vernon County. Bernie O'Rourke, the Youth Extension Livestock, Livestock Specialist, and Todd Taylor, the Arlington Sheep Unit Program Manager, are also assisting with the webinar series. Please feel free to reach out to us in the chat if you have any questions or comments, or feel free to email us at any time after this presentation. We are glad you could join us. If you joined a few minutes ago, you would have seen slides displaying an overview of using Zoom. If not, I will go over those quickly now. Please remember the most important Zoom functions, your microphone and video options, and they are located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. And the chat box is located at the bottom middle of your screen. Please leave your microphones muted during the webinar. There will be time at the end of the presentation to ask questions, and please ensure that your video is off. Place any questions or comments in the chat box and we will be monitoring the chat during the presentation and reviewing any items at the end to make sure we have all a great review. Lissa, you may um, have our poll now. Thanks, Carolyn. So we just wanted to learn a little bit about you and your farm. Um, so if you could answer this um, short questionnaire for us, we'd really appreciate it. few questions you may have, have to scroll down. Um, just curious about what part of the state you're from or if you're from outside of the state, how long have you been raising sheep or goats? And do you have a language preference? What type of small ruminants do you raise? And a little bit about herd or flock size. Give you guys just another maybe 30 seconds to finish up. Okay, Carolyn, I think that is about as good as it's going to get for tonight. Great, thank you everyone for answering those questions. That really helps us get to know who our producers are and where you're located so we can help um, create more programming. And before we um, turn it all the way over to Jean, Jean asked us to um, have another poll that just asks a couple of questions so that we you can get thinking about your parasite management program. Okay, so we do have the present, or excuse me, the poll launch. Um, the first question is, how often do you deworm your sheep or goats? And the second question is, uh, what is your current deworming management strategy? And as always, all of our polls are anonymous, so feel free to answer however you need to, honestly. So um, I just wanted to let you know that. I think we'll give you guys another 30 seconds or so to finish up on those two questions. Thank you so much for answering those questions. And I'm going to stop um, screen sharing and we'll let Jean take over.
Okay. Uh, let's see. I still have the poll up in mind. Does somebody have to close that or should I close that? Um, Gene, you should just be able to close that on your screen. Okay. I didn't want to end the poll for you. And let me see if I can share my screen correctly. And we'll uh, get going. So do you have my uh, first slide? Yes, we do, Gene. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, uh, thanks for inviting me back. I um, uh, haven't been gone that long, but uh, I always enjoyed uh, years ago participating in the webinars that uh, uh, Woody Lane initiated and Dave Thomas followed up in. And um, great that we have this technology now to actually share slides. And uh, um, this is a topic that uh, I've been working with and around uh, as long as I've had sheep. Uh, we started our flock back in 1990. Um, my, my mentor was a, a gentleman by the name of Peter Wood, uh, lived about 20 miles away from me, uh, purchased my initial breeding stock from him. And, and his initial advice was, Gene, if you're going to stay in sheep for any length of time, um, you're going to have to deal with parasites or how to manage parasites. And he highlighted that already dewormers were breaking down in New Zealand and Australia, causing a major problem, and that having a parasite management strategy was going to be important uh, for uh, long-term success. And we've, I've, I listened to his advice. He was doing sheep commercially uh, and, and appreciated that, followed it. I took it seriously. And as I've worked with uh, 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 other sheep producers, I've often talked about parasites, parasite management, and, and, and how it relates to grazing. And, and too frequently, um, you see producers and First year went well, second year, third year, somewhere around the fourth and fifth year, uh, they started losing, uh, losing livestock. And, you know, today I'm going to be using sheep because we've got sheep, but all the principles that apply to sheep are also going to apply uh, if, if you are a, a goat producer as well. It also applies to um, uh, alpacas and, and, and llamas, if, if we have any of those producers on this evening. Uh, so it, it's been an issue. Uh, a lot of those things that were happening in, in Australia and New Zealand are now occurring here. Um, we participated with Dr. Bob Leader probably about 15 years ago in a survey of Wisconsin, trying to assess where we were uh, in, in the state for resistance. And on the farms that participated, we were able to document uh, parasite resistance to um, two of the three major dewormers that were, were uh, present. We participated in it. At that time, we did not find resistance on, on our farm. So when we think about, let's see, if this is okay. Did that advance, Carolyn? Yes, Gene, it did. Yes. Okay. Um, so I enjoy she eating sheep. Lots of things eat sheep. Uh, we've got mountain lions, we've got coyotes, uh, bear, uh, wolves, even eagles, uh, bald eagles, golden eagles. We're fortunate in Southwest Wisconsin. We have all five of these predators present now, um, and, and they're pretty visible. We, we maybe not during the day, but we we know that they're around, uh, and they they have a fond taste for sheep. Uh, but there's other things that eat sheep that we we don't easily see, and these are our parasites. Uh, they're small. Uh, they're very difficult to observe. And we often indirectly see the symptoms of parasites. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's just uh, more difficult to think about. Um, predators, uh, when they attack a, a, a sheep or a goat, uh, is, is very sudden. Uh, they obviously reduce uh, production. It's kind of hard to sell a dead sheep or a dead goat, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's, it's sudden, it's dramatic, uh, and it generally ends in death. Sometimes it ends in maiming. When we compare that to parasites, we often see a reduction in productivity. Uh, it's very slow. In some cases, it may result in death. Uh, and it's more of a chronic loss. It's, it's that death by a thousand cuts, right? We don't notice that two-tenths of a pound uh, reduction in rate of gain. We don't really see 
that that ewe is losing body condition or that lamb is using body condition until we get our hands on it. So it's, it's much more subtle. Uh, it's much harder to observe and, and therefore harder to say, oh, I've got a parasite problem. Uh, so they're, they're very difficult or different, but they, they do both impact uh, the bottom line. Um, the the uh, NOM survey is the National Animal Health Monitoring Survey. Uh, they do this about every five years or so uh, for, for sheep looking at all losses. Um, predator losses are estimated somewhere around 30% of all losses between lambs and, and also about 30% on, on, on adult sheep as well. And then we've got non-predator losses, uh, losses from all other causes. And that survey is broken down into more reasons. Now, internal parasites are listed as, as one of those causes. As we look at flock size, we see that those uh, smaller uh, flocks, more common here in the Midwest, are the ones that have a higher percentage of losses from internal parasites. But other losses uh, might also be associated with uh, um, parasitism. And, and these may be those chronic losses, the losses of production that may not have resulted in death, but sometimes we'll see respiratory issues. We may see some other disease issues. We might see that starving lamb, uh, that starving ewe. And in some cases, we don't know exactly. We just, we just found a, a livestock dead. And we can't rule out that some of these losses may have been caused by a parasite load that was you know, complicating their ability to thrive in, in our environment and perform on our farms. So we, we, we can't say it's just 10% or 12%. I think the number might be a little bit higher on that, especially if we've been uh, at this for, for, for many years. When we, we look at uh, parasites, there are internal and external parasites. The internals would be uh, nematodes, the flukes, tapeworms, coccidia, meningeal worms, and uh, externals are those outside the, 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 the lamb or the ewe or the, or the, or the goat. Um, this evening, we're going to be focused primarily on the nematodes. This isn't to say that flukes may not be an, an issue uh, in, in your part of Wisconsin or that you may not be having issues with tapeworms or coccidia. Uh, but this evening, we're going to focus primarily on, on, on nematodes. I, I know um, in, in northern Wisconsin, if we have any uh, folks on from there tonight, uh, flukes are a tremendous problem uh, up in the northern part of the state. We're starting to see a few more of these down in the southwest part of Wisconsin, but it's not nearly as, as large of a, a problem uh, as other parts of, of, of the area. So whether or not we have parasites uh, depends on, on three different factors. The first, of course, is going to be your farm and what type of environment uh, do you have uh, on your farm. You know, we, we can't always change our environment, but sometimes we might be able to work on the second factor, and this is the animal or the genetics. Um, animals that we breed, animals that we buy come with a, a full set of genetics. Some of them may be more or less susceptible to parasitism. And then the third factor is, is us. It's the human component. Uh, you know, what, what are we doing that's enabling or discouraging parasites from impacting our herd or impacting our flock? Uh, another area where we can have a large impact, right? Because we are able to adapt or change our management to achieve a different end. And we're going to be focusing a lot of time on those two points that we can exert some level of control this evening. Now, keep in mind, if, if you're a nematode, they're not very visible to the naked eye. Uh, they're, they're, they're microscopic, just, just teeny tiny things. They're not extremely mobile on their own. Uh, where they get deposited manure is where they're going to stay. Uh, the way that they move around is by moving our livestock around. Um, they don't get up and cross the road, right? They're not going to move that far. They can't physically do that. So our grazing management plays an impact on how we are moving parasites uh, around our pasture, around our farms. So nematodes need a few things to survive and understanding the, the life cycle and their requirements gives us some insight onto what we can do uh, to maybe adapt or change management to interfere with that life cycle. 
number one, uh, nematodes need moisture in order to survive. Uh, they don't have a hard coating. They're a very soft bodied uh, creature and they exist in the water film on grass. Now, this is a drop of dew on a blade of orchard grass. And if we can get that microscope in on that, we could see a series of nematodes floating in that water film uh, on that blade of grass. Nematodes also need moderate temperatures, not too cold, not too hot. We don't have a parasite problem right now here in Wisconsin. Uh, it's, it's winter. Uh, eggs that were, you know, uh, if, if the, the nematode females were mature and laying eggs, those eggs wouldn't survive uh, on our frozen tundra. Likewise, if we get too hot in the summer, if we're getting over 90 or to 100 degrees, those also are not good conditions in which parasites uh, will survive. So temperature and environment plays an impact on survival and the parasite load. As you might expect then, if you're a producer in Florida or the Gulf Coast states where they barely get winter or freezing, they have a year round problem. Northern states like Wisconsin and Minnesota and Michigan, we get a reprieve every year. We, we get a winter off where we maybe don't have to worry quite so much about parasitism uh, because of our, our environment. Uh, in this case, cold frozen tundra is a good thing. The last thing nematodes need to survive is at some point, they're going to need a meal, not just any meal, they need a blood meal. Uh, so they have to have a host. If they never find a host, they don't mature to an adult stage, they don't reproduce, and then they don't wind up reinfecting our, our pastures. So we need all three of these things at certain points of that, that nematode life cycle. Uh, in order for them to perpetuate the species and continue to reproduce and, and continue to, to reinfect our pastures and in turn re reinfect our sheep and goats. So if we watch or, or, or follow that life cycle uh, uh, from the sheep to the pasture, back to the sheep or goat, back, you know, all, all the way around, uh, we have an adult animal inside of our livestock that, that's reproducing. Those eggs are shed in, in the feces uh, and they pass out onto pasture. Eggs take roughly five days to embryonate. So to go through that hatching phase and, and break out of their shell and enter that L1 larval stage. Now, the, the important part here, I think, is that not all of the eggs deposited start embryonating right away. Some sit there and are dormant. Uh, and, and this is a I'm gonna say it's a survival adaptation. They're not putting all their eggs in one basket uh, as the saying would go. Some will start embryonating in, in 10 days or 15 days or 20 days, uh, but they still go through that five day period before they hatch. They'll go through that L, L1 and L2 stage living on the leaf litter at, at the base uh, of, of the soil, right where the, the plant uh, litter is and they're, they're, they're feeding on that at that particular point in, in their life cycles at about their L3 stage. Uh, so L3, they're approximately 21 days from uh, uh, ha hatching on the pasture. This is the stage that they need to be ingested by that host. So it takes a lot of effort. They're going to move themselves up those, those blades of grass to a height where they can still exist in the water, in that water film, and then wait for uh, a, a, a host to come along and graze them off and adjust them. Develop into L4 and L5 uh, in, in our host. This is when they are uh, feeding in uh, different membranes, uh, either a blood feeder or they're working in the mucosal membranes and other parts of, of our sheep and goats, and they mature into that adult worm reproduce, breed, reproduce, and start that cycle all, all over again. So we're looking for potentially points along the cycle that we can interrupt it, where we can uh, send this uh, uh, askew uh, and, and try to uh, reduce uh, infection. Now in, in Wisconsin, um, and, and I, 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 I'm not a veterinarian, so I can't explain the process, but we do know that nematodes enter what's called a hypobolic state. Uh, it's a state of arrested development when they go dormant for the winter. Um, 
because it's a poor survival strategy to push eggs out when it's frozen because the eggs won't survive. Uh, and, and then they will wait for spring. And, and it's that uh, uh, L4 and L5 that will uh, uh, embryonate or, or excuse me, hi hi hibernate inside the sheep uh, so they can exist in the sheep over the winter. And then the L1 and L2 can exist on pasture, even though it gets cold in Wisconsin, they can go into that dormant state. So our cold doesn't kill everything. Uh, it does kill the eggs, but not some of those early, early stages of larva. Uh, the trouble when they're in that hyperbolic state is we've only got one effective dewormer that will, will, will uh, uh, work on that. So that, that hypobiosis is uh, an inhibited development uh, and um, uh, they'll also do this in periods of drought oh, when it's extremely hot, extremely dry, and those eggs won't survive. Uh, and, and, and nothing that the, 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 the sheep or the doe can do uh, is going to prevent that. Uh, it, it, it just occurs. So the, the, the avermectin family is uh, the one antibiotic that is still effective uh, against this hypobiotic state. If we're deworming uh, in late fall, when, when they've gone into this stage, uh, avermectin is really our only choice uh, if, if we'd like to kind of clean things out and have them clean coming into spring. So our, our, our issue uh, and why some of us, why we're here tonight is, is because of the development of resistance, right? That, that we're no longer able to control the worms like we uh, were able to do earlier on uh, by, by drenching or, or however we were, were uh, uh, um, controlling uh, parasites uh, before. The, the official um, definition of when resistance occurs is when we've got a 95% or less reduction in that fecal egg count. So we're no longer getting 100%. So we're, we're killing 95% or more. We're going to say it's still working. If we get below 95%, we're saying we are starting to see resistance occur. Very widespread in sheep, extremely widespread in goats. We've documented in horses. We've documented in cattle. We're documenting in swine. All have reported uh, resistance to our, our dewormers. So you know, a long-term strategy, we, we, we need to figure out how we're going to work uh, around this. Uh, it, it, it is a growing issue and it's a threat to uh, producers of all species that are raising them uh, on pasture. So it occurs because of management of, of, of what we are doing or how we're doing it. Uh, and it, it is unfortunately inevitable unless we take some proactive steps to, to manage around it. And, and we we're seeing this even beyond parasites in, in the whole rest of, uh, of, of agriculture in managing all pests. So insects are becoming resistant, weeds are becoming resistant, and it's from overuse of a single mode of action in controlling uh, the pests that are, are, are uh, impacting what it is that we're trying to, to uh, produce. And it, it comes from, um, the genetic diversity that we have in a random or wild population. And it recurs as a result of, of, of selection. And it's, it's our unintentional selection that's, that's leading to um, this genetic resistance. So nematodes have a very high uh, reproductive rate. If we look at a homonchus contortus uh, female, homonchus contortus is the barber pole worm. Uh, a mature female is going to lay something in the neighborhood of 10,000 eggs per day. The threshold for treating a sheep for homonchus is about 200 eggs per gram. So if we look at the amount of sheep poop an average you might produce, I'm going to say it's four pounds. We're producing about 1,850 grams uh, per you per day. That means they're shedding something around 370,000 eggs shed per day times the number of sheep or goats in your flock. That's a lot of eggs. If we have a hundred ewe flock on one acre, we are shedding 849 eggs per square foot. Now, not all of those hatch. Uh, some are non-viable. A lot of them are still going to hatch and they're all not going to hatch at the same time. Uh, so, 
we can very quickly and very effectively contaminate a pasture if we've got resistance uh, out there, uh, if we, we've not been paying attention. If we go the other way, 370,000 divided by 10,000 eggs per day, you know, we're thinking we might have only 37 females laying eggs in, in that flock of 100. And if something is 99.99% effective, some of those are getting through. They are surviving. They're survi surviving to spread those resistant genes to the next generation. And as we do this over time, we increase the level of resistance. So why we don't see parasite resistance early on, if we're a brand new shepherd, our pastures are relatively clean. Right, we, we don't have a high level of, of, of infection or, or, or uh, uh, eggs contaminating our pastures, but over time, we quickly build up um, that reservoir of, of uh, parasite resistant uh, 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 nematodes. Another way to look at that is, is in this color graphic, initially we'd have an even distribution of a, of a different set of genes over time, through management, we start selecting for a certain genotype. By about the fifth to 10th generation, we can eliminate one entire genotype of all the susceptibles, and we're left with one uh, or two that are very resistant, that are now reproducing and breeding with one another, increasing the frequency of, of the genes that enable it to survive our, our deworming treatment. So one of the ways that we manage around this is uh, the concept of refugia or keeping worms in refuge, right? We, we think about all the nematodes as bad and evil. We got to get rid of all of them, but we want to try and manage that population uh, diversity. We, we want to try and keep some of those parasites that are still susceptible in that genetic population of, of parasites uh, that are present on our farm. So we can only do that if we don't treat everything. So we will have worms or, or, or uh, nematodes that haven't been exposed to that anthelmintic treatment. If we haven't treated everybody in the flock or everybody in the herd, uh, those susceptible genes are still present. They can, again, turn and breed with those resistant genes and continue to keep some level of susceptibility present in, in that population. So there's always going to be some words or worms uh, that are, are, are resistant. Uh, we, we can't really get rid of those, uh, but we can help manage the population of those uh, susceptible uh, parasites uh, that are, are present in our, in our farm. So we do that by not deworming everybody uh, or selective deworming. And this is a, it's a delaying tactic. It's, it's just trying to slow uh, the rate of, of, of change of anthelmintic resistance. So the longer we can continue using something and it's effective, uh, that, that's good for us. We've got more tools in our toolbox. So we, we don't treat everybody every time we leave some of those animals untreated. Uh, and we think about how we're managing uh, those are our pastures to maintain some of that genetic diversity on the pastures. So one of the, the, the things that uh, I didn't think about at the time, but now is starting is has made more sense to me, is that in, in the past we would have some clean pastures that hadn't been grazed with sheep, and then we would deworm and put the flock on that clean uh, pasture that without without parasites in order to again. Uh, help uh, uh, avoid that burden. Now, the indirect outcome of that is that if we didn't kill 100% of the parasites with our deworming treatments, what was left was resistant ones, and the only population that would exist on a clean pasture would be resistant parasites. So we, we, we don't do that any longer. We put them back out on, on uh, uh, different pastures, so we can, again, keep that, that population diversity intact uh, uh, on our pastures. Too often, farmers are very guilty of it works, just use it more often, right? Uh, why would we wanna do something different? So things that impact deworming uh, and, and, and increasing resistance are 
using improper drenching techniques. Uh, we may be drenching that we think is a full dose, but if we don't get that adequately back past the blocking motion of the, the soft palate, uh, we may not get that entire drench down the throat of the lamb or down the throat of the doe. Uh, porons. Uh, porons are very effective for external parasites. There's marginal uh, data on their effectiveness for internal parasites, how much of it is actually being absorbed, and the interference of lanolin, if we have wool sheep on that absorption, uh, under dosing. Uh, often we underestimate the weight of our, our livestock and we're not giving them that full, full dose. Uh, other things that lead to resistance and how we're managing is, are we using the same family uh, chemistry? Are we only using avermectin all the time? Or have we only been using the fenbendazole or the white dewormers? Uh, and, and if we've been doing that for too long of a time, uh, we will certainly encounter some resistance. Uh, starting too late in the year. Uh, if the first time we deworm is because we saw a dead sheep, we're already behind the game. Uh, we need to be checking on a regular basis and trying to stay ahead of the curve where we can and treating the ones that really most need, most need it. And then while we did say we want to go back to a pasture that's been exposed, we don't want to go right back onto a pasture that's been heavily contaminated over time that has a very high parasite burden. Uh, the other part, and we, we just talked about that in the previous slide, is, is going back to that perfectly clean pasture, uh, which would now have only a resistant population on it. So one of the key tools that we use in deciding which one uh, of our flock or our herd uh, to treat is something called thamacha, uh, and it's a, a technique to evaluate levels of parasitism. And it's specifically to deal with anthelmintic resistance or resistance to dewormers. It was developed by a veterinarian in South Africa, Dr. Francois Milan. Uh, Fafa Milan chart was what the FAMACHA was derived from. And uh, uh, it was by observing villagers and what they were doing or not doing. And to improve the success of, of, of the villagers, he was leaving uh, deworming products and he'd come back and they weren't out yet. And, uh, you know, the, the villagers explained where well, we're only treating the ones uh, that need it, which seemed like an odd statement to a veterinarian, but uh, the villagers explained that, well, we just, we can see the parasites in their eyes, which seemed a little bit odd, but when they looked at it, what they were, the villagers had learned was that if they look at the mucosal membrane, they could see changes in the pigmentation of that mucosal membrane. And so they, uh, Dr. Dr. Milan started taking uh, blood samples and discovered this high correlation in uh, packed cell volume, the amount of red blood cells directly correlated with the uh, amount of parasitism. And this was the, the, the development of the FAMACHA test or the FAMACHA technique for evaluating them. So the, these guides uh, uh, um, are, are looking at that level of anemia. Uh, this is a, a, a goat eye, uh, a sheep's eye would look similar. Uh, and, and we can see uh, that, that change in pigmentation and what those different levels are. So level one is that healthy red, dark pink color. Uh, a five would be extremely anemic uh, with, with zero pigmentation, no red or pink color at all. These are the ones that are in the most immediate need and, 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 and need a, a immediate attention. And then we look at twos, threes, and fours being kind of intermediate in that. That three is that one we'd think about as borderline. And we can go through the flock or go through the herd fairly quickly once you perfect the technique. Uh, and, and, and anything that's a one or two, we'd probably not treat and let those go. And, and that is the source of your refugia. The ones that are, are fours and fives, definitely we have to do something. We don't want animals to die. That number three is that toss up. Do you treat it or not treat it? And the number three, we probably would treat if we're treating most of the flock. If we're not treating most of the flock, we might skip that one and, and see uh, how that uh, uh, how that performs over the time. 
the FAMACHA card is, is, is uh, uh, available if you've gone through FAMACHA training. Um, I'm not sure where my supply of cards wound up. I don't know if I sent them to Bernie or Carolyn, but I'll try and remember where I sent those. But we do have a supply here in Wisconsin uh, if we do some more FAMACHA trainings. Uh, the technique is relatively simple. Uh, it it is, does take two hands, so it does take a little bit of practice. But you gently push in on the eye uh, from the top above the uh, upper lid and then uh, kind of pull down and roll the lower eyelid. And it, it, it very quickly and easily exposes that mucosal membrane. And, you know, the first time or two, you're, you're going to be using the card. But over time, you get really good at this technique and evaluating uh, what that particular color uh, looks like. The, the, the challenge with FAMACHA is it's only useful for the Hamacus contortus or the barber pole worm. This is a blood sucker. This is the one that causes anemia. It's also the one that's most likely to cause death, right? So it likes warm, moist climates with summer rainfall. Boy, it loves it here in Wisconsin, right? It is adapting to our cooler climates. Uh, it is potentially the most detrimental in terms of causing death uh, and also an extremely prolific uh, egg layer. Uh, this is what I used for my example of egg contamination on pastures. Uh, another, besides the, 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 the white around the eye, another classic symptom of this is bottle jaw. When you see that swelling between the mandibles or between the jawbone, uh, right under directly on the lower side of the, the head. Uh, for homonchus, uh, this is a blood feeder in the abomasum. Uh, we'll see weight loss, that thin lamb, that thin U that just doesn't seem to be doing well uh, over time. We might see some you know, sheep that have a harder time keeping up with the flock as we move them around. Part of this is weight loss, right? They just don't have the, the energy. We see the anema, anemia, we see the edema or the bottle jaw. Uh, most often, if we're not paying attention, what we'll see is a dead sheep, and, and, and which in case we need to do some solving, uh, problem solving of figuring out what, what's going on. Other worms that we've got out there uh, are, are the uh, small brown stomach worm, also in an abomasum one. Uh, this is where we'll see a rapid loss of, of, of body condition, but unlike the homonchus contortus, here we'll see profuse scours, that really runny uh, butt, uh, just, just hanging dags on the back, just, just really soiled. With homonchus, we, may not see, we won't see any diarrhea. That's not a symptom of homonchus. So we can look at some of the symptoms to kind of diagnose the worms that we, we think we're, we're, we're having. Uh, other um, worms that occasionally occur on some farms are the black scour worm and the bankrupt worm. We have a whole host of nematodes that, that can, can impact it. So the strong aisles are occasionally a problem, um, and, 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 and they're, they're more farm-specific or, or region-specific. They're not nearly as, as widespread. Uh, so we, we've got some others listed here, the hookworm, the intestinal worm, scuperia. Um, and that's not that we should ignore these, but... Uh, uh, um, we also have to keep an eye out for them. And they're, they're, they're more or less uh, 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 area or region specific. Here in Southwest Wisconsin, my, the, the last point we've got is the meningeal worm. Uh, we had a real challenge with this for many years. Uh, we have been ahead of this now for about, I'm gonna say about 20 years now uh, where we have not had the issue with it that we were having initially. Um, and other, other parts of Wisconsin have zero problem with meningeal worm. Uh, it was just uh, uh, kind of indigenous to, to, to our area. So nematodes, can't we come up with a product and just kill them all, right? They're no good. They're no use. They're, they're taking uh, my sheep. They're, they're reducing my, my, my uh, uh, profits. Let's just kill them all. We've got so far at least 28,000 different species of nematodes. Uh, and they're, they're not all bad. Uh, nematodes are a pretty broad family. They feed on plants. They feed on animals. They feed on soil fungi. They feed on microbes in the soil. And there's even nematodes that eat other nematodes. So they're really a, a, an essential part of, 
the whole food web. Uh, we don't have anything specific enough at this point in time that we just kill the bad ones. We, we wind up killing them all. Uh, so that probably isn't a practical strategy for us to uh, implement. And our best guess is about 1% impact ourselves, uh, crops and animals that we raise. The other 99% are, are pretty benign. Um, so then we have to step back and ask ourselves, do we really want a parasite-free pasture or parasite-free livestock as a goal? Uh, what we're really after, I think, is to prevent disease and prevent production losses, right? So that we can enjoy our sheep and, and hopefully earn, earn a profit. So as a manager, we need to learn how to manage and live with a certain level of parasites. So what's a farmer to do? Well, we can interrupt the life cycle. We can employ strategic drenching. Uh, we can practice FAMACHA. We can look at lowering some of our stocking rates. We can think about genetic resistance. We can do a better job with grazing and grazing taller. Uh, perhaps we can implement some longer rotations out to the more of the month period. Uh, we can also impact the diet by feeding uh, room and undergraded protein or RUP uh, or bypass uh, protein. So a better diet improves uh, resistance of our livestock to sustain that parasite challenge uh, more than a, a lower protein diet. Clean pasture, we'll, we'll come back and visit that a little bit. Um, when we start implementing two, three, four of these, we are doing the principles of integrated parasite management or integrated pest management. We're throwing a different set of tools rather than relying on one single tool of deworming to control those parasites that are impacting our production. So FAMACHA uh, is, is really related to two different things. FAMACHA is used for strategic drenching, only treating those animals that really need it. It's also useful in selecting for genetic resistance in our flock. Using what the parasites are doing, genetic selection uh, within our flock to pick those that are resistant to the parasites themselves. So FAMACHA then becomes a key technique to learn uh, in order for us to manage our parasites. So interrupting the life cycle. That life cycle, as you remember, was about three weeks from the time they hatch, uh, and then five to nine weeks be before we get to that peak egg hatch. If we can interrupt that with a different livestock species, we, we don't have a host. Other ways that we can interrupt the life cycle is to make hay. Uh, the larva, the eggs do not survive the hay making process, or if we're making baleage, the, the, the ensiling process, there is no moisture uh, for those to hatch and live uh, in, in, in dry hay. So we could use that as one possible technique, if, if, if that's practical for your farms, to interrupt that, that life cycle. Multi-species grazing is another possible technique. And I remember in that earlier slot or earlier poll when we began, several people are already doing that. Uh, often we see sheep and goats, they're similar size. They might have similar uh, management things uh, as far as facilities. But when we look at parasites that impact sheep and goats, we see about 100% overlap. So nematodes that impact sheep, the same nematodes are going to impact goats. So we're, we're not going to get that interruption of that life cycle if we've got uh, sheep and goats in on the same farm. Cattle, on the other hand, uh, we have just one area where we have some overlap. This is in Homonchus contortus, but they are species specific. There is a Homonchus contortus that impacts cattle. There's also Homonchus contortus that's unique to sheep. So far, we've only documented cattle homonchus impacting sheep. We haven't impact, shown sheep homonchus impacting cattle. Uh, horses are a dead end host for any, everything except for other horses. Uh, pigs are dead end hosts for everything except other pigs and the same with chickens. So we, we have a little bit of, of, of options here, maybe not perfect. It'd be great if sheep and goats didn't overlap so much, 
but we can interrupt that life cycle if we are able to put some cattle out there or perhaps uh, put horses on a, a pasture for a period of time that's been grazed uh, by sheep or goats. Um, we've already talked about that. Strategic drenching. Um, we, we've already touched on FAMACHA, treating only those that animals that need it. If we see that we are treating the same you or the same doe two, three times over the course of a season, that might be one to think about culling. Uh, if we're, we're really concerned about managing around this whole uh, parasite resistance topic. And then she doesn't contribute her genes to the rest of your herd or the rest of your flock. And those animals that haven't been uh, treated or required treating are the ones that are contributing to, to those future generations. Other techniques are the first item listed are fecal egg count. Uh, we can collect fresh samples, uh, either a pooled sample from the flock or we can collect individual samples uh, and send those in for a, a fecal egg count. Some of our local vets uh, do do that, uh, do perform that. Uh, there's also uh, Mid-America Labs, uh, Don Bliss, I believe he's still working in uh, Verona. Uh, so that's a commercial lab that will do a, a fecal uh, analysis. They'll tell you the numbers and the types of eggs present in that fecal sample. And then the, the, the other option we've got is doing that strategic drench in the spring uh, before we see that rise in, 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 in the population. So just a, a quick review, our, our FAMACHA system, looking at a score of one to five, one being healthy, red, pinkish color, five being extremely anemic, and the correlating uh, pack cell volumes for those different numbers. Uh, different parasites have different sized eggs uh, and, and different sized shapes of eggs. And a, a, a good parasitologist, uh, or, or a veterinarian that's done this many times, can actually tell what those differences are. Uh, when I've looked at these under slides, they all look alike to me. Uh, I, I, I have not gotten the skill down. You look at the, the homonchus uh, on, on my left, uh, the trichosungalis, and, and there's three or four that look very, very similar. They're a similar size, similar shape, uh, very difficult to, to distinguish, which is why uh, I've always tried to hire a professional uh, to do this because it's just outside of my skill set. But there are differences that we can observe. Uh, the strategic de de deworming, uh, strategic drenching in the spring uh, is, is thinking about when we're lambing. Some of us might be lambing now, others of us might be lambing later in March or April. But as that you goes into those late stages of, of pregnancy, as she's preparing to lamb, she loses her, her resistance uh, to um, the parasites that might already be uh, inside her and might be coming out of that hypobiotic state. And so if we can deworm early and reduce that population, we have less shedding going on to our uh, spring pastures. Uh, and, and if we don't do that, what we see is just at the point when we're weaning, uh, a huge rise in the number of uh, parasites that are available to impact our lambs, which are now not on mom, that uh, have the stress of weaning, and now they're on heavily contaminated pastures. So strategic uh, spring deworming is going to occur uh, right in the middle of lambing uh, before we turn our sheep loose on pasture. And the idea of reducing the level of contamination on those, those uh, early uh, spring pastures and keeping the parasite burden uh, relatively low. Grazing management, what can we do uh, to, to impact survival of a, of a, a parasite on pasture? As you recall, the, those parasites do need moisture in order to survive. So we, we can graze taller. Uh, and, and try to graze above where that contamination zone is. Uh, parasites, so those nematodes, again, are small. They can't crawl to the tip of a 12-inch blade of grass and get back down to moisture by 10 a.m. Uh, they just are not that mobile. 
So if we're grazing taller, uh, starting at eight, 10, 12 inches, maybe a little bit taller and stopping at four to six inches, uh, we can graze above uh, quite a bit of the contamination that's gonna be lower in the sward where it's cool and damp the entire day. Uh, and, and many of our grazers with, with sheep and goats are using this very successfully uh, to, again, manage that parasite load on pasture. So longer rotations. Uh, again, we think about this, this three week or so uh, life cycle uh, coming out, the, the, uh, being deposited in, in, in the feces on pasture, embryonating, hatching, going through L, L1, L2, L3 larval stages, right about the time, 21 to 28 days, when we might think about coming back onto that pasture uh, for, for that grazing after it's recovered. Is there any way that we can stretch out that rotation, uh, allow it to grow for a longer period of time? Well, you know, there, there might be some things that we can do. We can graze with our flock, we can graze with our herd, allow it to rest with cover, uh, let, let it rest and recover. Uh, if we can come back with a different species, if we can come back with horses, if we can come back with cattle, we've got a longer rotation before we've come back with sheep allow it to rest and recover again, another three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, maybe we can take a cutting of hay, allow it to rest and recover, uh, and then maybe come back and graze again with the sheep. So, you know, we, we have almost two to three months uh, between grazing with sheep, contamination level wouldn't be zero, but we think it would be quite a bit lower that it may not be in fact impacting the, the, the success of our flock uh, on that. Can we, you know, I guess the questions come up, how long will, will parasites exist on, on a pasture? And, and, and the answer is quite a long time. This was a four-year study uh, a few years ago, looking at how long uh, parasites were present uh, after they were contaminated. So they took all the livestock off and then they went back and started sampling it. And, and you can see on average, Hamonchus contortus was there six months later. Ostertagia was there over a year later, Cuperia over a year later. Um, so so uh, the longer we can go, the lower the population, but even if we wait a year, we can't say it's gonna be parasite free. Uh, so these things are pretty darn hardy. Uh, they're gonna be with us for quite a while. Uh, but again, we're trying to manage the population and manage around that as much best we can. Other things we can do in grazing management, we can think about crop rotations. Uh, if we have any uh, crop ground present on our farm, uh, planting cover crops. There shouldn't be any parasite issue when we plant a cover crop. If we're using some annuals, such as sedan grass uh, for summer grazing or, or anything that's an annual crop, we shouldn't be having a, any issue with parasites uh, on those particular fields. Other forages that might be very helpful are forages that have condensed tannins uh, this was that rumen undergraded protein. The tannins protect that from degradation of the rumen and it passes into the true stomach. And that higher protein level actually makes that sheep a little bit more resilient to uh, basically have a much lower uh, 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 load of parasites in her system. The two forages that'll grow in Wisconsin birds with trefoil, I think grows statewide. There's a couple pockets in the western part of the state where Cerisia lespediza seems to be growing now. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not a widespread one. I don't know that I'm gonna recommend that for the entire state, but if you're in an area where it might grow, that might be another condensed tannin forage uh, that may bear some uh, investigation. Uh, another crop that isn't a condensed tannin forage, but we are seeing the lower levels with is uh, chicory, uh, forage chicory uh, is, is another one that's got some some qualities about it that seem to make the, uh, uh, our livestock more resilient. Uh, these aren't dewormers. It just means that they're still able to perform with a parasite challenge uh, in them. So this is uh, me geeking out on pastures and, and parasites. Uh, I, I, I think it's just, just kind of fascinating, but it also gives us some insights on what we should be doing. Uh, if we have a contaminated pasture and we have a large diversity in our, 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 our sheep population uh, as far as genetic diversity, and we did an individual fecal egg count. What we would see is not all livestock have the same level of eggs. 
So what we are seeing in our flocks and in our herds is resistance. Uh, that uh, 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 they aren't getting impacted or those eggs are not hatching and impacting uh, certain individuals within our herds or within our flocks. We also will see individuals that have very high levels of eggs, but they're not showing any clinical symptoms of anemia. There's no symptoms of parasitism, even though they have high levels of parasites, eggs in, the, in, their, in their feces. These animals are resilient. And then, of course, we've got those animals that are showing parasitism and uh, in, in varying levels. And, and when we look at the broad data set, uh, we, we think we've got 20 to 30% of the herd uh, responsible for 70 to 80% of that pasture contamination. So the, the, the key here is this is the basis of that genetic selection of why we should be doing FAMACHO, why we should be identifying those individuals that don't need treatment and using those, assuming they've got other desirable characteristics, uh, for, you know, bucks or, or, or rams or does uh, or ewes that would contribute to uh, our, 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 our growth of our flock. And it is heritable. In, in the sheep industry, the, the Katahdin breed has been the leader in this. Other breeds are starting to pick this up. Uh, and, and, and it is an issue that we've been using on our farm for many years, uh, just looking at those individuals that haven't needed treatment and trying to spread those genes uh, further. Um, so parasites do have uh, an expected progeny difference. We can uh, put a, a lot of pressure on this. Uh, if you wanna go and geek out some more on this, uh, uh, David Riley and Loretta Nagiri uh, at Texas A&M have done a lot of work on, on parasite resistance and the heritability of this. So it is something we can have a lot of impact on. Once we have uh, resistance, resistance we think is, is forever. We, we don't revert back unless we've got a population of susceptible that we can breed back to. We have three main classes of dewormers for sheep and goats, the tramisols, the avermectins, and the bendazols. And the current thinking is keep using that uh, over the course of a year uh, unless it fails. And uh, at some point we may have to go to combining uh, two different classes of wormers. Now, I'd be working with my veterinarian on this to make sure we're observing proper withdrawal times. Uh, I'd rather not get to uh, the stage if, if we can at, at all avoid it. Uh, but if, if, we, if we aren't proactive in that, this is going to occur at some point. There are a couple other uh, new anthelmintics out there, Zolvix and StarTech. These were developed uh, overseas. Uh, they are not available in the U.S. And because sheep and goats are such a small industry here, um, I, I haven't talked to any pharmaceutical reps reps that have said this is likely to come our direction. They just don't see this as a big enough market uh, for them to go through all the um, hurdles of, of getting this passed through, uh, you know, licensing and regulations to make this available to us. So there are things out there. Uh, they aren't going to be available to us. Uh, natural uh, organic dewormers, uh, interest for a lot of producers. There are some things that may be worth considering. Uh, there's been a lot of work done looking at copper oxide wire. Uh, it's actually not really a wire, it's just small, uh, small pieces of copper wire uh, that we put into a bolus and we, we, we push down their, their throat. Uh, so we, we see about a 50 to 90% reduction uh, in parasites when we've used the copper oxide wire uh, bolus method. Of course, our caution with sheep is sheep are very toxic uh, or susceptible to copper toxicity. Um, we don't know if this is going to, um, over time, uh, cause an issue with more mature sheep. Lambs, if they're going to market, it's not going to be a problem. Mature sheep that have had copper wire uh, uh, boluses for, for many years, we might see uh, 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 some issues with copper toxicity. Other things that uh, have been tried and researched, uh, pumpkin seed, we get very variable results. Um, probably not on a recommended list, but uh, some producers are finding, again, uh, some results on it. It's hard to 
uh, give a, a prediction on the repeatability of it or the success of it. So um, this has been tried. Uh, garlic, uh, the chemical is allicin. Um, there was a pretty big push probably about, I'm going to say 10 or 15 years for uh, a garlic drench. Uh, and again, it, it, it kind of works sort of, uh, variable results. Uh, and uh, 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 again, that's you use at your, your own risk. Uh, I don't know that I have 100% confidence that it's going to work every time. Other things that have been uh, looked at, examined, uh, uh, run through some, some trials, uh, wormwood, uh, variable, but low as far as an impact on um, uh, deworming uh, and, and reducing that population. Uh, so uh, again, if you're really adamant about um, a natural or organic dewormer, uh, a few potential options that, that may help you, um, uh, it, it'd be a case of how, um, how severe is my parasite problem. And, and, and maybe like the IPM, we need, might need to look at using more than one of these uh, or these in combination with some other of the, of the uh, uh, practices that we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, the one I also wanna add down here is diatomaceous earth. Uh, in, in, in every study that I've looked at and read, uh, we have not seen a reduction in fecal egg numbers with diatomaceous earth. I know that's disappointing. It's pretty common. Everybody likes to swear by it. But if we take a pre-test, uh, pre so if we collect a fecal sample uh, before administering diatomaceous earth and then take one after using diatomaceous earth, that's what we're using as a measure of effectiveness. Can we measure a change in that, that uh, fecal egg uh, number? And, and, and uh, unfortunately, this one doesn't seem to, in, in multiple studies, have not shown any effectiveness. Um, uh, here's some effectiveness from uh, 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 um, Maryland on some work that they've done with a, a couple different uh, dewormers and goats. Uh, the, the COWP is the copper oxide wire particle. Um, again, showing some uh, level of reduction uh, in, in uh, parasite numbers in those fecal egg counts. What about a vaccine? Uh, this is really kind of exciting. A, a part of this was uh, actually initiated here in the United States uh, uh, parasitologists ground up uh, some, some parasites and, and injected them into the sheep, and they started to see a small immune response. Um, this is being uh, worked on over in uh, Ireland, uh, the Morundan Institute, uh, and is, is undergoing some more clinical trials. Uh, this would be really kind of cool if we had this available to us. I don't know, again, if our market is big enough that the companies would go through that regulatory hurdle uh, to bring this here, but there are some potential strategies out there or, or, or things on the, 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 the horizon that, that, that could be effective uh, for us. Uh, here's another natural solution, uh, Dudingtonia flagrans. It's a natural nematode trapping fungus that exists in the soil and uh, we, we feed spores to livestock, it gets deposited on the pasture, and as those uh, uh, eggs hatch and are going through their L1 and L2 start stage, they become entrapped in, in this uh, soil fungus, and the fungus uses them to basically uh, reproduce and uh, over time reduces the, the uh, population of parasites uh, on on. Uh, uh, on the pasture. This has been under develop, I'm going to see development at least for 15, maybe 20 years, uh, just looking at those natural, natural uh, uh, solutions. Um, avermectin uh, was de derived from uh, the dewormer avermectin or ivermectin is the commercial variety, but it's the avermectin fungus. Uh, so we're, we're looking at natural systems for controlling parasites. The, the, the commercial product of this is called BioWorma, uh, it is uh, available here in, in the U.S. Um, you know, we, we, we thought about maybe doing some demonstrations or trials on it. 
it seems to be really expensive. Uh, so uh, uh, at some point we may need to uh, look at this opportunity a little bit more closely just to see the, you know, the, 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 the nuts and bolts of how this might work and what, far, what farms this might be a good, good choice on. Um, we also have, uh, I'm not paying any attention to time, Carolyn, so if you need to interrupt me, just let me know. Well, that's fine. We have a, you know, a few minutes. Um, it's fine. I would like you to finish your presentation because I know everybody's interested in it okay. and I don't want to okay. rush you up. And we only have a few um, questions in the chat. So um, continue. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can't see the clock. Uh, so no problem. Uh, the, the other part that we do when we do FAMACHA training is, is we train producers in uh, what's called the five point check. And the five point check was developed to address the weaknesses of, of the FAMACHA uh, uh, system itself. So as you recall, FAMACHA is only effective for, uh, or primarily effective for, for Homonchus contortus, but we do have other parasites. So what are the, the signs or symptoms on other parts of our sheep or goats that we can look at and, and, and then maybe get uh, kind of a, a, a sleuthing of, of uh, diagnosing what might be happening if we don't have that fecal leg count. So number one, we look at the eyes, that's that uh, judging for anemia, the level of homonchus contortus. Uh, it also, uh, anemia is a symptom of liverworms or hookworms. There's a couple other things that do result in anemia. After that, we look down the back of the animal. We're trying to evaluate body condition score. And I think we've done some programs on body condition scoring and the value of that. And it's a good tool that every, every uh, a, a goat producer and every sheep producer needs to learn to do. Uh, but if we see that unthriftiness, that skinny, that thin, uh, we're, we're looking at primarily the brown stomach worm or the bankrupt worm. Um, so if we see thinness, but there's no level of anemia, we're leaning towards that brown stomach worm or something else. Looking at the tail uh, or basically under the tail, we're looking for fecal soiling. Do we have, you know, when they're dry, we call them rattles, but you know, that, that runny butt, you know, where, where there's manure on the hocks, on the legs, on the tail. Um, so that, that's, that, that's severe diarrhea. Here we're looking for brown stomach worm, bank warp worm, and coccidia, right? Uh, now, you know, coccidia is, is, is not a nematode, uh, it's an oocyte, uh, but if we're seeing good body condition and then uh, soiling under the tail, now we're eliminating the brown stomach worm or the bankrupt worm, or we're less likely to suspect, suspect that, and we're leaning towards uh, coccidia. Jaw, the jaw we'll see barber pole worm and coccidia. Uh, if we see uh, uh, the, the, that bottle jaw symptom, but there's no anemia in the eye, then we're back to coccidia, right? And so we're using these as a diagnostic tool. Finally, for, 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 for sheep, uh, the first number five applies to sheep. And this is looking at the nose. Uh, are we seeing any nasal discharges? If we're seeing discharges, snot, frequent snot coming out of the nose, uh, we're leaning towards nasal uh, bot flies. The second number five is for goat producers. Uh, and this is looking at, at, at coat condition. Uh, you know, what, is, what does the hair look like on our goats? And you know, is, is, is it it's as shiny and flat? Is it rough? Uh, is it kind of in between? And, and some of those have a connection to the level of parasites uh, in, in that animal. Um, quickly, just thinking about body condition scoring, it's really the, the amount of muscling and fat and condition on it. Uh, you're looking at the spinal process and the ribs uh, and, and uh, you know, how, how, how over-conditioned or right-conditioned or under-conditioned are they? And, and this may have a connection with our parasites. Looking at DAGs, uh, our zero score is, is zero DAGs, very clean uh, to a four, which is those ones that were, you know, perhaps um, uh, just runny, uh, drippy, uh, widespread. Uh, this is a, a severe case of, of, of diarrhea and a connection with uh, uh, parasites. Other resources uh, that you can look at, uh, Worm Boss is uh, the Australia program. 
uh, dealing with parasites where it's a major issue uh, for, for, for them in, in, in New Zealand. Uh, the, the Maryland Small Ruminant Page is another great resource. Uh, um, uh, Shanian's got some really good uh, resources available to, to you. And then uh, the American Consortium of Small Ruminant uh, Practitioners, uh, which is the ACSRPC, uh, has uh, resources on alt dewormers and uh, where a lot of the material came for this presentation tonight. I think that might be my last slide. Very good, Gene. Thank you so much. I know this is the second time I've heard this presentation and it just reminded me of all those things that I need to think about and get ready for this um, coming grazing season. So thank you so much for that presentation and all the information you shared with us. Um, before we move on into the questions, we are going to launch just a survey poll about the webinar tonight. So feel free to answer that. And then we're gonna go into the question segment if that's okay with you, Gene. I'm good. Very good, thank you. So Jean, we had a few questions in the chat and I know that you've probably answered a couple along the way. So if I get one that uh, you already answered, just tell me we got through that one. Um, we did have a question. And I, I don't think you'd um, gotten to this one in particular. It was a question about uh, with the variation embryonic stage um, for eggs and, and um, you know, kind of hibernating for a little bit. Um, can you estimate what percentage is that like that five days versus um, those that may have been um, kind of hanging out and then hatching at the 10 or 20 days? Do we have any data on that? I have not seen data on a percentage basis. Uh, we know that the largest hatch is going to be in that five day period. Uh, so um, is, is that 50%, is that 90%? I can't get that specific on it. Um, but we do know the majority are hatching early. Um, and the analogy I would think about is um, if we buy seed, uh, grass seed, alfalfa seed, clover seed, there's a percentage of hard seed that, that doesn't germinate right away. Uh, and, and it'll germinate later, uh, someday when the conditions are right. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about parasite eggs surviving for five years, um, but uh, they will survive for a period of time on pasture only to hatch at a later time. Uh, so that, that's, that's a good question. I don't think we've got, at least I have not found data that gives a, a hard number to what percentage that is going to be. Great, thank you. Um, we kind of had a follow-up um, to something you talked about earlier, um, you know, some of the different um, parasite species. Is there a map of the state that has um, some of the more common parasites, um, the internal parasites by region? Is that something that's floating around out there or are the ones that you mentioned pretty common uh, across the state of Wisconsin or the Midwest? Yeah. Uh, the only map that I have ever come across was uh, regarding liver flukes, uh, fasciola. Uh, and uh, because uh, if you're processing lamb or goats, we can get condemned livers. I don't know if anyone's had that issue come up, but uh, it, it is one way that we can track where, where it is spread. And what, what's uh, very heavy in, in, in northern Wisconsin, uh, and then it came to, uh, it, it, it followed the Mississippi flyway. So it's being spread by migratory birds. So uh, you, you look at the distance from the Mississippi River and uh, it, it's moving out from there, which is where we're, we're um, 40 miles from Mississippi. And, and, and uh, so it's not coming from the North for us, it came from, from the West. So that's the only one I've seen a map of. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd be thinking more in terms of, uh, um, it's my farm low and wet, is it high and dry, is it sandy? We would probably see 
uh, different species in, in those different environments. Uh, coccidia uh, needs standing water at some point. So if you're in a wet area, uh, chances are of having coccidia uh, are probably greater if you're uh, than on a, on a dry farm without without standing water. So not not a specific map uh, uh, except for those, and, and and I'm not sure. It'd be an interesting project, I guess. Uh, had, hadn't thought about that, but yeah. this one but um do we have a temperature at which the homunculus um larva um die in the pasture um because we do have some folks on from different states and just kind of curious um what that temperature is where it starts becoming really hostile and they start going into that um hyperbolic um, mode yeah um there is a temperature, there is a number. I, from memory, I'm gonna say it's like a, a 90, 92 degree soil temperature. I don't wanna give you bad information here. Uh, if, if you recall the drought of 2012, uh, not a bad parasite year. Uh, nothing was surviving in those temperatures. Uh, 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 um, on short overgrazed pastures uh, that summer, I was recording 100 degree soil temperatures. Um, it, that, 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 that killed a lot of things. It killed a lot of soil life, including parasites. Now, if we're doing a good job grazing, um, uh, after I recorded some of those, I came home and was, was measuring my soil temperatures. We were still having 80 degree soil temperatures. So we, we still had parasites. Um, it was dry, um, but but uh, uh, there there is a number. Um, I'm not going to swear by by that by by the ninety, but it, it's 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 somewhere in that range. I have to look at my hidden slides. I may have that in there somewhere. I think that covers um, the questions that we have time for tonight. I know that there may be a, a couple um, here and there that um, we still have out there. And if folks have a, a dire um, need to get a question answered, um, Jean, I think you would put your um, contact details up on your first slide, I believe. So if um, mm -hmm. folks need that again, can we can we drop that in the chat? Um, sure. Um, usually I check email in the mornings. Uh, if I have got time, I'll, I'll try and get back to you or if not by the weekend. Uh, okay. So I thought I saw a question on cold. Uh, they're pretty cold tolerant. I mean, once they're, once they're dormant in that L, 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 L1, L2 stages, uh, uh, I'm going to say, you know, you know, five, 10 below, um, is probably not a problem. And, and you have to remember now the soil temperature might not be that cold, especially if we've got uh, snow cover, you know, that snow insulates, it moderates that soil temperature. We don't really get the soil um, extremely cold where, where it might be impacting survivability of, of, of those parasites that are already on pasture. Great. Well, Jean, thank you for your time. Um, and I think, Carolyn, did you have any last words that you wanted to share with the group? I did not. I just want to thank Jean again for coming. Oh, my video is off. Nobody can see me. Thank you, Jean. Thanks, Jean, for coming back and uh, giving us that presentation again. We greatly appreciate that. And if anybody has any follow-up questions, sure, go ahead and contact me, Lisa, Bernie, Todd, Ashley sure. at Extension, or um, we can get you connected with Jean as well, or we can kind of go be the go-between. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you next month with JJ Jones, and we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about meat goats. So thanks, oh, everyone. J JJ does a great job. Good. Glad to hear that. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night.
Thanks, Chelsea. Have a great night. See you later. Carolyn, did you need anything else from us? Oh, you're still recording, by the way. Oh, thank you.